but uh, yeah, thanks, John, for joining us. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Welcome to another RVC community webinar. As I just mentioned, we are going international this week, which is why we do not have this on a usual Friday at noon. Um, but today we are chatting all about clean tech investing in the hydrogen energy market. I've learned so much just from starting to put this panel together and um, working with some of our portfolio companies in the hydrogen space. And it's absolutely fascinating. And we have, as they say, the best in the biz here. Um, but before we get to that, I want to give a quick introduction to the Rockies Venture Club, the hosts of this webinar. Um, my name is Emily. I'm the programs manager for RVC, and we are the longest running and one of the largest angel investing groups in the United States. We serve to connect uh, angel investors with early stage entrepreneurs, and we do that through education, through networking events, <laughs> through um, now all virtual webinars such as these, um, lots of lots of different uh, ways to get involved every week with RBC. Um, of all of the entrepreneurs that we see in a given year, we invest in about 25 companies annually. And we also syndicate a number of deals across the United States. So if you're curious to learn more from either an investor side or an entrepreneur side, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, there are many ways to get involved with RVC. Most notably is becoming a member. We have entrepreneur and investor memberships, which gets you free access to a lot more content, um, education, networking, so forth. Um, we have different meetings throughout the year, masterminds. Um, you can apply to pitch, become a mentor. If you are an investor, you've had a, had a long career in entrepreneurship. So we would encourage you to take a look at how to get involved. Um, one other quick thing to plug here. We just opened up registration for our Angel Capital Summit. This is one of our largest events of the year. It's taking place at the end of March virtually, but it's gonna be great. Um, we have two days of keynotes, panels, uh, networking opportunities, plenty of pitches from entrepreneurs that are seeking funding and our signature RVC investor forum at the end. So to learn more about that, I'll drop the link in the chat once I stop talking because I'm not good at multitasking on the Zoom. Um, if you have any other questions about RVC, about Angel Capital Summit, please feel free to reach out. Uh, but without further ado, I'd love to pass it on to my colleague, Mike Connolly. Mike is um, an angel investor with RVC. I believe he's been with us for a couple of years, um, has jumped head first into the world of angel investing. Uh, and has just done an absolutely fantastic job bringing this content, these speakers to you all today. So. Mike, I'll give it to you. He will be the moderator for this session. Uh, thanks, Emily. Good, um, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome. Uh, thank, uh, thank you especially to our three panelists uh, for your participation and dedicating your time to this event. Um, a little background, a uh, quick background. About five months ago, I was fortunate enough to become the uh, co-lead investor uh, with John Laporto on the uh, Starfire Energy deal here at RBC um, and working through the uh, investment process, um, including a, a comprehensive due diligence report and uh, work and communicating with the angel investors interested in the deal. Um, it seemed to me that investing in the Starfire uh, clean tech uh, market um, was uh, and, and specifically in renewable energy and uh, carbon free energy. Um, it was a different uh, scale of impact and a different time frame of investment than many of the uh, RVC uh, portfolio companies uh, in the more technology and uh, um, life sciences arenas. Um, so as I was working on it, I was, I was seeing that uh, hydrogen energy was actually quite a bit um, in the news and uh, it seemed to be growing. And uh, as we were working to increase uh, investor interest with Starfire, um, John suggested, uh, and uh, Jennifer Beach, the COO at Starfire, uh, heartily agreed that uh, an informational hydrogen energy presentation might help 
uh, illustrate to the RBC investors um, why hydrogen energy is an exciting investment opportunity. Uh, Jen graciously fed me with uh, some of the uh, contacts she has in her extensive uh, renewables network. And when I reached out to uh, these folks, um, ended up feeling like a panel discussion would be a, a fun way to uh, do some information sharing with the RBC investors. Um, so without Jennifer's help, uh, this event wouldn't have happened. So I wanted to uh, make sure I thanked her for her help and uh, uh, contacts. Um, the three panelists with us today represent a diverse range of uh, perspectives in the hydrogen energy market. We've asked them to uh, present their organizations and that perspective uh, here this morning in a, a brief presentation to give you all uh, an idea of where they fit in that hydrogen uh, ecosphere, as well as uh, you know, they, they, their knowledge is so significant that uh, you know, I think that helps everybody understand um, what, what is going on in, the, in that uh, arena, the hydrogen arena. Um, after we present, we'll go into a panel discussion uh, around angel investment in, in this space and uh, you know, weave in any questions that arise from the audience. You know, we're trying to uh, keep the topics, the questions, and uh, our uh, panel discussion uh, close to uh, areas of interest of angel investment, sort of in the areas of opportunities, constraints, timing. And so uh, as you frame your questions, we'd appreciate if you're keeping them in that neck of the woods. On to the panelists. Um, our first panelist, Brian De Bruin, is Director of Operations of the Colorado Hydrogen Network. Uh, Colorado Hydrogen Network is working to deploy hydrogen vehicle fuel stations here in Colorado uh, to seed the market um, for hydrogen uh, fuel cell vehicles. He's passionate about uh, hydrogen energy and the transportation sec uh, sector, and uh, I think it's uh, really you know, neat to have a, a local uh, presence like this. Our second panelist, uh, Shelly, Shelly uh, Zargari, is a marketing and strategy and uh, marketing strategy and content manager for GenCell. Uh, GenCell is a fuel cell uh, technology company based in Israel that recently uh, completed their IPO and is now listed on the uh, Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. Uh, Shelly is passionate about the renewable energy space, uh, working first in the solar uh, energy sector and now in the hydrogen and uh, fuel cell sector. And then our third panelist uh, is from London. Michelle Robson is an associate with AP Ventures. They're a venture capital firm headquartered, as I say, in London. Uh, they're focused on investment in the hydrogen energy segment. Um, Michelle sits as an observer on the board of several of their portfolio companies, and uh, some of their uh, investors are large um, international corporations. So uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Brian to tell us a bit about uh, the Colorado Hydrogen Network. Well, thanks, Mike. And uh, thanks, Emily, for this opportunity to address everybody. Um, as Mike already pointed out, I'm the uh, director and one of the founders of the Colorado Hydrogen Network, which is a relatively new organization. We're just maybe about 14, 15 months old. Um, so here's a little bit about us. Um, my background is that I worked for 36 years for Honeywell Aerospace. I was an entrepreneur, I'll say, within the organization. I had pretty free reign to come up with uh, not only new product designs because of my engineering background, but also the, the business aspects of it. Um, it's pretty tricky in our business to uh, try to figure out how to finance things. And so I had a lot of experience there and decided when I retired that I really wanted to see fuel cell vehicles taking off. Nobody seemed to be doing it. And so I founded this organization with help from some pretty prestigious folks here. We've got uh, Dr. Brian Wilson, who is the uh, executive director of the Colorado State University Energy Institute, also known kind of uh, form informally as the powerhouse up in Fort Collins. 
And then Franz Westenbrink, who's a retired VP general manager with um, Woodward up in Fort Collins. So we're sponsored by the Colorado Clean Tech Industries Association or CCIA, as some of you may know it. Um, we collaborate very closely with the organizations you can see there. We had a, um, our charter meeting with them to kind of get their blessing to kick things off. Um, and uh, they've continued to participate with us. Another thing that uh, I do is I've got a podcast. Uh, it's heard all over the world, um, all the continents, except for Antarctica, of course, as people always say. So you may want to want to tune that in. It's on most of the, the podcast uh, uh, applications like uh, Apple and so forth. So let's talk for a minute about why hydrogen. I think you know, there's a lot of confusion out there. People think of it as uh, just a substitute for petroleum, and it's, it's really a little bit more than that. What, what hydrogen can do is it can provide kind of a portable and storable, storable form of renewable electricity. You know, electricity has to be used the minute you generate it and uh, in the same amount that you generate it. And we need ways to transport that energy onto transportation and, um, and other uses. So the, the reason you can do that is that hydrogen can easily be made from renewable electricity or turned back into electricity. I don't know if any of you when you were kids put two, two spoons in a glass of water and connect it to a battery and hydrogen bubbles off one and uh, one of the spoons and uh, oxygen off the other one. It's kind of the same principle. And the other thing that's really an enabler now for hydrogen is that uh, electricity from wind and solar are dropping the price of electricity. And this is uh, making hydrogen competitive with gasoline. And we'll, we'll talk to that a little bit more. And hydrogen provides really an ideal energy source for fuel cell EVs. Now you've all heard of battery EVs. Some of you may own those. There's another type of EV out there. It's not as common, but it's the fuel cell EV. So uh, why Colorado and why now? Well, Colorado is in a unique position in that they're aggressively moving towards 100% renewables. Uh, Colorado passed what's called the Zero Emission Vehicle or ZEV regulation. And what this does is it provides credits for automakers for their zero emission vehicles. And so this is really going to interest the, the automakers in bringing the vehicles to Colorado. Um, and I think that really gives a boost to that. The Colorado Hydrogen Network has already deployed the first hydrogen fuel station. And I'll show you some, some pictures of that. It's on the Energy Institute campus that I, I previously mentioned up at uh, Fort Collins. And fuel cell EVs are really better suited for Colorado conditions. And I'll, I'll compare the two EV types in here in just a minute. But uh, with our cold climate and uh, recreation, the amount of distance that a lot of people in Colorado drive to go from Denver up to the mountains, as we always like to say, um, we've got 500,000 skiers in Colorado. So uh, fuel cells are really, uh, fuel cell EVs, that is, a really good solution for that. And as I mentioned, uh, hydrogen can be priced competitively with gasoline. And that's based on the low electric rates that we have here that they didn't have in California. So that makes Colorado a little bit different than California and the way they're doing things. So, so why fuel cell EVs? Well, if you look at this, you know, marketing 101, take a, take a look at this from the user's perspective. If you're going to ask people to convert from petroleum vehicles to something else, it's got to offer the same performance and convenience as what they're used to. Um, again, as two types of EVs. So the battery, they're really the same. The battery EVs get their energy by charging and fuel cell EVs get their energy from hydrogen. So they work just like a gasoline vehicle. You pull up to the pump, put hydrogen in and, and away you go and everything else is pretty much the same. So the things that uh, they're really good at is quick refueling, you know, three minutes, just like your car. Um, the range is unaffected by cold weather. I'll talk to that again in a minute. Um, they can provide energy freely for all sizes of vehicles. I, I like to say for motorcycles up to the, the biggest trucks. And, you know, we've got a lot of people here that tow um, recreational trailers, you know, camping trailers, uh, caravans as they're called in, in England. Um, tools and they tow snowmobiles and boats and all those other things. And battery vehicles are really going to kind of struggle with that. So let's kind of look at this just real quickly from a customer's perspective. So let's say you walk into a car dealer and uh, let's say it's just a year or two in the future and you've got the choice of you know battery EV or gasoline or fuel cell. Well, if you're going to use a car for running around town just to go to the store, go to work, uh, pick up the kids at school or whatever. Uh, a battery EV is really a good vehicle for that. Very cheap to keep. You can keep it in your garage, keep it topped off with a charge, really works well. But for people who 
take long trips like I do. I drive back and forth between uh, Denver and Albuquerque probably every month. Um, some of the facets of battery vehicles aren't so attractive and we may have trouble trying to get people to, to accept the battery vehicles. You know, if you take a trip, here's an example, a 450 mile trip, you'd have to charge for about an hour. Well, I stop once for gas, takes about three minutes. Refilling temperature, a lot of people don't know this. You cannot charge the battery on a, on a battery EV if the battery's below 32 degrees. I sometimes have to keep my car outside and it's cold, I can't do that. So the range also is greatly reduced at cold and hot temperatures because the heater and the air conditioner take a lot of power that comes out of the battery, which are things we kind of get for free with a, with a gasoline vehicle. So you don't think about that. We just use the waste heat to heat the vehicle. Big vehicles, you know, the bigger the vehicle gets, the bulkier and the more expensive and the heavier the battery gets. And for commercial vehicles, it really cuts into their payload. So that's a big deal. And then towing I already kind of talked to, but so here's, here's the one weak point right now of the fuel cell EVs, and that is hydrogen fuel stations. And that's what uh, we've really founded Colorado Hydrogen Network to, to try to address. So as I said, we uh, have our first fuel station uh, through connections with NREL and others, we were able to get this donated. And the picture on the bottom right is what it looked like when it was installed in Washington, DC. The picture on the left is we haven't installed it yet. It was just dropped on the campus there. It's built into two 20-foot uh, cargo containers. And uh, so we're, uh, we have meetings this week with the city to get the permitting and things set up on that. So our second phase of getting fuel stations going is we have this strategy to build the market. You know, there's this chicken and the egg stalemate of you can't have stations till you have vehicles, you can't have vehicles till you have stations. So we're going to address both of those at the same time. Our plan is to deploy a critical mass, we like to call it, of five stations. We're going to finance that with public and private investment. We're working with the legislature. We're kind of hopeful to get some funding this year on this. And we're going to price our hydrogen at a, a parity, I like to call it, with, uh, with gasoline, premium gasoline. And that's a big difference from California, where it's $14 a kilogram. We'll probably be in the 750 range here. So we'll be building the demand by going out to Denver area businesses with collaboration with Clean Cities and uh, a bunch of others, Colorado Department of Transportation and so forth, to basically educate the users here that uh, fuel cell vehicles could be in their stable of, of vehicles if they choose to do it because we're going to provide the fuel. And there are um, subsidies available for the vehicles through Alt Fuels Colorado, which is the Volkswagen settlement money. Now, Colorado Hydrogen Network is a nonprofit. And so it's really inappropriate for us to take investor money and go spend it on, on stations. So we're standing up a, uh, an LLC called New Day Hydrogen, which you can see here. Um, I think some of you may know Seth, he's, uh, he's our CEO. Um, we have Buford Barr who comes out of the oil industry and has a lot of experience with uh, developing large projects. And so he's a really uh, strong asset to have. Uh, Patty Kelly is uh, our instigator and our fireball in the group. She really keeps us motivated and going. She's got a Harvard, Harvard, a Harvard law degree and uh, has done quite a bit of lobbying. And then of course myself. So that is the end of my presentation. And uh, I think we'll take probably questions uh, at the end. Awesome, thanks Brian um, for giving us that local flavor of the hydrogen uh, market. And uh, it's, it's interesting seeing Colorado um, sort of jumping into the lead there. Uh, you know, California uh, people know about, but uh, I think it's just very cool. And, uh, and uh, I think a real nice compliment, one of the reasons I was excited about having you and, uh, and then our next panelist, uh, Shelly Zargari, from GenCell, uh, the um, fuel cell uh, manuf uh, developer, manufacturer, technology company in Israel. So um, Shelly, if you would, uh, could you tell us a little bit about GenCell and how uh, the hydrogen um, energy sector is, it plays with uh, the hydrogen fuel cells? Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you uh, from a pretty large distance, but virtually it's all the same thing when we're across Zoom, right? Um, can you see my slides? Yes, yes. Looks good. Uh, you're in uh, like design mode. 
Okay. There we go. Is yep. that better? Yeah, it looks okay. good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So first of all, um, so I'm, I'm happy to tell you a little bit about the experience that Gensol has had uh, over its history, which I think is a good example of what's happening in the fuel cell um, industry and sector. And it's uh, exciting to see where everything's going to go. And I did want to just mention, uh, for those of you who might not be aware, there's a very interesting organization called Mission Hydrogen based in Germany. And we gave an excellent webinar yesterday um, through Mission Hydrogen. So if you want to check out that website, you can, you'll find a very interesting discussion about, uh, about um, the kind of um, unique opportunities for backup solutions and complementary solutions between batteries, UPS, and fuel cells that we can provide using our alkaline fuel cells. But I'm going to start at the beginning here. So um, you can see here a picture of our commercial fuel cell, alkaline fuel cell. And I'm going to talk about how hydrogen technology enables clean backup and off-grid energy. And as Mike mentioned, the company went public recently. So of course, I have to include the safe harbor. Uh, basically, Gensol Energy started in uh, 2011 and it was founded by three, uh, two high-tech entrepreneurs that met up with uh, a for, um, scientist from the former Soviet Union with a lot of experience dealing with fuel cells for the space program for the mission. And I'm sure you're, and, and uh, they came together and uh, started the company. And we get put our first commercial fuel cell on the market in 2016. And the company was basically supported in the first years by some private investors, including Benny Landa of Landa Ventures, a, very, a serial entrepreneur who has been involved in a great deal of innovative companies in the printing and nanotechnology spaces. And this year, when the company decided to expand to mass production and needed to raise more capital, we decided to go uh, public. And just in November, the company was um, was listed on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. Starting, uh, we, we raised, um, I think it was about $60 million now um, with an after money after money value of 800 million shekels. So that's you know, more or less uh, for 200 million shekels after money value of uh, 800. And the company till now has done very well over these first couple of months. So we're very, um, we're very enthusiastic about the opportunity ahead of us. And as I mentioned, so the company has three founders, Rami Veshef, our CEO, and Gil Shafid, who's our chief business development officer, and Gennady Finkelstein, who came out of the Soviet Union with a great deal of experience and a team of many PhD scientists with a lot of background in electrochemistry to, to, start, the, to start the company running. We have around 80 people on our team, including, as I said, many space and submarine um, experts, and, as well as young people coming out of the Israeli army with a lot of uh, ingenuity and, and great technology background. So um, I'm not gonna take the time. I know that we don't have the time really to go through and, and watch. Um, I have a nice movie here about what a fuel cell is, but basically fuel cells have been around since the 19th century and Initially, they were very expensive, very complex, and used only for very special purposes, such as I mentioned for the space system. And Apollo and Mir systems were run, used the fuel cells to produce energy and clean drinking water. Gensel decided to take this technology and make it affordable for Earth use. So what does this involve? First of all, we needed to reduce the cost of the, of the fuel cell. So in the first place, one of the main reasons that fuel cells have been very expensive to date is that they generally involve noble metals. And um, one of the first patents that Gensel um, came out was to remove the platinum from the from the uh, catalyst for the fuel cell. And this makes, enabled us to reduce the capex in a, in a very significant way. A second important development was using a special CO2 scrubber, which allows the fuel cell to 
take um, its oxygen from ambient air, it's not requiring any filtration and purification. So that's another real important development. And on, then on another side, as we recognize that what was the real big impediment to bringing fuel cells to market, and I think uh, Brian touched on this, is has to do with the hydrogen logistics because when you need to move such a, you know, hydrogen as a gas, it's either going to take a lot of energy to cryogenically liquefy, and that's going to be very expensive and problematic, or trying to transport it as gas, and it's very voluminous and problematic. The way that Gencell decided to um, tackle this issue was to come up with a way to extract hydrogen from liquid ammonia. So we've come up with our own patented ammonia cracker, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the future. So these patents have made the fuel cell far more um, affordable for various applications. And just to make it clear, uh, probably you've heard about PEM fuel cells. Most fuel cells and the fuel cells that are mainly used for the cars that Brian was talking about are proton exchange membrane fuel cells. And GenCell instead is going with the alkaline fuel cell technology, which has high efficiency and is able to be resistant to extreme weather conditions. And that makes us a little bit unique in the market. So in 2016, we brought to market our G5 long duration UPS. This is a backup system and basically it connects to a cylinder of hydrogen and, and you can connect it up to, um, you know, to any device. And if the power goes out, your fuel cell will immediately kick in and provide power for as long as the hydrogen is available. We're basically um, making this available to various market sectors. One of the, uh, one of the main for mission critical facilities that require, um, you know, cannot be with uninterrupted power. And not long after that, we recognized that there was a huge market need for this solution in the utility space. So in, in that case, we came, we added, however, uh, an import, an additional feature, which an enclosure that enables the system to also be seismic resistant and to withstand earthquakes. So this is our G5RX utility backup solution. And it's been installed at the San Diego Gas and Electric, where basically, if you think about it, when utilities have substations, they've got big rooms full of batteries to back up the auto reclosers in the event that uh, there would be an outage. And with climate being what it is today, and obviously in California, all the issues of the wildfires and problems. So there are very high risks of outages and the battery rooms are limited to a, a four hour capacity. By connecting the fuel cell to the battery, you can, in, in effect, you can enable the system to run for as long, basically without any, uh, without any limitation, as long as you can continue to bring hydrogen. And going forward, and we're in the beta phase of testing our A5 off-grid power solution, which takes advantage of the ammonia cracker that I mentioned earlier. In other words, we connect to the fuel cell an ammonia cracker that enables the fuel cell to extract hydrogen from liquid ammonia. So effectively, you can take this product and put it in a remote location next to a tank of ammonia, and it will run uh, uninterrupted 24-7 for as long as a year. Our commercial system is already installed in 18 countries, and you can see some of the countries, some of the companies we're working with, many in the utility space, as well as some uh, emergency first responders. And we've got it running actually in a champagne factory in France and uh, some other interesting places, as well as in Israel. As I mentioned before, the A5 off grid solution is using what we call our silver bullet, the liquid. Uh, the liquid ammonia, which is the, has the highest density of hydrogen, and that makes it the most economical uh, carrier for hydrogen. Um, I guess it's relevant for you guys to think about, well, what's happening? Fuel cells have been around for such a long time, and, you know, kind of the shares weren't going anywhere. But obviously now, with all the issues 
of uh, uh, with with the world finally waking up and recognizing how very important it is to decarbonize every industry sector. There's more and more realization that the role that hydrogen can play in this important um, in this important challenge. So you can see that um, all country basically. I mean, over the last year, Japan, um, Australia the UK, Germany first, and South Korea, many other countries have been talking about how there are hydrogen um, policies and coming forward with investing very, very significant resources to enable their different industry sectors to move to hydrogen. And fuel cells as the equipment that are most capable of uh, taking advantage of that hydrogen, they're seeing a renaissance. So from where we are today, because the commercial product that we have, this is, by the way, there, it's a very um, expensive prospect bringing a fuel cell to, to market because, you know, there, it involves a great deal of know-how and technology and testing, and it needs to withstand very significant issues. So um, it's, it, there's a big barrier to coming to market. So we're very proud that we brought our system to commercial use and it's already in use in, as I said, in about 30 or 40 um, locations in 18 countries. Um, but um, now that we have, now with, with, uh, with the huge um, interest now, we're able to move forward with our future products. So looking at the roadmap going forward, as I said, one of the reasons that we were able to raise capital now is through an important partnership that we initiated with TDK, the Japanese conglomerate, who have been looking to, at our know-how regarding ammonia, the ammonia cracker, and our plans to synthesize green ammonia in the future at a level of grid parity. So we are looking, first of all, to take our existing ammonia cracker and up and scale up to support transport applications that, like Brian mentioned, for large vehicles. And you can see here um, the example of a bus project that we're looking at. In fact, if you use the ammonia cracker, which has the capacity to um, very, with very high efficiency um, to extract a very high volume of, of hydrogen and comparatively very low price, this is gonna enable us to, up to act, in fact, develop very low cost hydrogen filling stations that would be able to work with buses that ran on alkaline fuel cells using our technology. So this is a very exciting project that we're looking at in the next couple of years. And, and then going forward, of course, our biggest problem today is of course the fact that, um, you know, you have a lot of renewable energy, a lot of solar energy, wind energy, but it's only available intermittently and the hours that it can be produced. And of course, the big, the big answer, the big problem to resolve the puzzle is storage. How are we gonna store the energy that we can produce in, the, in these certain hours and make it available when people need it in the, in the evening hours and, when, uh, and other peak times? So, the solution, the biggest solution available certainly seems to be hydrogen. And how are we going to store that hydrogen? As I said, what we see as the most uh, highest potential hydrogen storage carrier is ammonia. And this is why we're looking to produce, green, to synthesize green ammonia. The, today, the ammonia is produced primarily through the Haber-Bosch process, which is a of using methane and it's an extremely carbon, uh, it's a very dirty process, you know, that produces a lot of CO2. So uh, around the world, there's a huge interest now in moving away to try to reduce emissions by, move, by producing green hydrogen and green ammonia. And this is part of our roadmap going forward. And we see that when we reach our, we have, um, we have some know-how which will enable us to synthesize green ammonia in a far, uh, at a far more economical way than, than what's available on the market today. So, as I said, 
First of all, we have the opportunity with our off-grid solutions to provide um, electrification and electricity for remote telecom towers. And in the in terms of the grid, we're because our I'm sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. I apologize. But in any case, I want to also mention a very important point, which is that um, certainly the energy sector today is moving away from this centralized power plant and monopolistic view to distributed energy. And that's another very important market for our commercial fuel cells that will be, uh, that you can basically with weather getting worse everywhere, everywhere, every small businesses that want to be prepared um, for emergencies are can can invest in having independent distributed energy resources behind the meter or in their own uh, you know as the proprietary in their as their own property and these um and here our fuel cells can play a, a big role they can also be used to support batteries. They're very complementary to when you have a battery that has a, a, a battery gives you a high charge for duration. So the fuel cell is the, it complements by recharging the battery in numerous times and gives you far longer lifetime for your battery that can manage dynamic loads. So even EV charge points, as Brian mentioned, are, which are problematic for the grid, the more we have more EVs coming in, they can also be supported with fuel cells. And in the longest picture, as I've mentioned, we have the issue of green ammonia that will uh, enable us to reach our final clean loop of green energy. So let's like, let's see that while you know, at one time, and this is they talked about the fact when Henry Ford came out, there was you know there was discussion about the fact that the horses there wasn't possible to put more horse and bugs on the road because of issues that were you know the fuel that the horses were dirtying the streets you know and there was a big problem nobody knew how to get to the next paradigm. Henry Ford came and changed that picture, and here today we talk about. It's time for the paradigm to shift again. And let's, I'd like to imagine a, rule, a world with far fewer combustion engine, and combustion engine vehicles and moving to clean green power. Thank awesome. you. Awesome, Shelley. Thanks Sorry, so much. I was uh, a little nervous there, but okay. Oh, well, that's quite <laughs> all right. It's, it's, it's the casual group and uh, we wanted to, uh, you know, find out about what's going on around the world. And I think you've done a, a wonderful job there of explaining how fuel cells fit in, you know, right now and then uh, into the future. So uh, thanks very much. And, uh, and I think it also interesting, it ties in with uh, Starfire's uh, technology and the, the green ammonia and how that fits into hydrogen. So thank you. Um, let's move on now to uh, our third panelist, Michelle Robson from AP Ventures. Uh, Michelle comes to us from London, and uh, you know, they, uh, AP Ventures looks over a number of different technologies, and uh, Michelle will tell us about those and how they uh, see the hydrogen energy market. So, Michelle, turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much, and I hope you can hear me. Sounds good, and we can see your uh, slides. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. Um, thanks also to you and the rest of the RBC for inviting me. Um, I'm really excited to join you all today virtually and to be part of the discussion in an area that um, I feel quite passionate about. Um, and it's great to be talking to others that have a growing interest in this area as well. So I'll just talk briefly about AP Ventures and then I want to spend the bulk of the presentation on how we approach investing in this area um, and, and sharing some of our insights that I hope will also help you when you're also evaluating the potential investment opportunities. So AP Ventures is a, um, go down, let me see. Yeah, here we go. Um, so AP Ventures is the, the largest um, venture capital fund focused on the hydrogen industry. And we have investments globally um, 
throughout the hydrogen value chain. And I'll talk a little bit more about what some of those interesting areas can be in a little while. And um, we're, we're very fortunate to have support from seven amazing um, limited partners. And I've, I've got them there on the screen. And they also span across the globe. So we've got um, South African entities, we've got a number of um, Japanese partners, and also um, a European and French automotive um, uh, supplier as well, who uh, along with us share um, a common interest um, in seeing hydrogen really move forward um, as being one of the, 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 the key levers that can bring about decarbonisation. So across our two funds, we have about 320 million US under management. Um, and, and typically we're looking to deploy that into early stage companies. Um, so we, we typically, typically talk about series A or B, but we've even done C deals in the past and we'd look later into growth as well, potentially. So as there, you can see on the slide, just some of the areas where we have invested either currently or in the past. And there's a couple of, I suppose, what we like to think of as household names, or at least if you're in the hydrogen space, you'll think of them as household names. So um, Ballard was a, um, a company that we invested in quite early on, um, and we've now realized that, that investment. Uh, we currently are invested in plug power as well, and we're very much enjoying seeing plug go from strength to strength. But there are a, a lot of other really interesting companies um, which are developing innovative, te innovative technologies in this space, which we think are super interesting. Um, so for instance, we've got Hyatt Hydrogen in the Netherlands, which is creating an electrochemical compressor, um, which should enable you to um, both extract and purify and then compress um, hydrogen very, very cheaply. Then we've got Hydrogenius, which is a technology company based in Germany, which has developed a really novel um, technology to transport hydrogen by bonding it to an organic carrier and then enabling that enables hydrogen to be transported as a liquid in a really safe and efficient way. And then also you would have heard us talk about Starfire Energy and we were delighted to be able to support Starfire Energy in their most recent um, uh, uh, funding round. And together with the RVC, we're really looking forward to supporting them as they continue to develop and grow. Um, and I'd also point to technologies such as Zeg Power based in Norway. And Zeg has de is developing a, a technology for uh, blue hydrogen production. And really what that means is it's hydrogen that can be produced from either natural gas or biomethane, uh, but they are able to capture all of the CO2 and store it so it's not released to the atmosphere. So you've got a, a zero carbon hydrogen source. I think it's also important to, to point out that when we make our investments, we're always supported by a bunch of, um, by a very strong co-investment base. So, um, so together, we're always looking for others um, to support us as we invest in these, in these innovative technologies. Um, and that's very, very important because these co-investors um, help these portfolio companies to develop and grow, not just through their funding, but also with providing them access to, to projects, um, uh, offtake, um, support with supply, um, and, and just providing a, a really great support further down the line. So then, look, I, I won't say too much on this slide because I feel that Brian has more than you know capably covered this one. But for us, why we believe in hydrogen is, is, is very, very simple. It's because it enables uh, renewable energy produced in one place to be used in another place. And you, it, you can use it across huge distances and across time as well. So it, hydrogen enables us to um, transform our society to be based on renewable energies. We believe it's got pretty infinite supply. As much renewable energy as you can produce, you can turn into hydrogen. Um, we are developing more and more ways of being able to transport it easily, cheaply and safely. Um, it, you can produce it with no carbon footprint, either via electrolysis, or you can extract it from methane and you can capture the carbon and either store it or use the carbon for another, for some other use. Uh, and it has incredibly high energy density compared to other sources of zero carbon fuel as well. Um, and this means that when you do store it, you can, and you store it in large quantities and for long periods of time, 
so it can provide access um, to people in other geographies that may not have easy access to renewable energies and it enables them to be able to decarbonize. Why as investors, you may want to be interested, I think is, is clear on this slide. Um, so this was put together by the Hydrogen Council and I know the timeline is somewhat far out and we'd like that to be 2025, not 2050. But what you can see here is the hydrogen market is, is expecting to undergo significant growth in the future. And, and we think that this may even be an, an underestimate given what we've seen, given the, um, as Shelley was alluding to all the, the hydrogen strategies and investments that are being um, developed and made around the globe. So hydrogen obviously um, has a use today, um, but we think some of the really interesting new applications are going to be to decarbonize some of those hard to abate um, segments. So as a, as a feedstock, um, we've heard lots about using hydrogen to decarbonize things like, like ammonia, uh, steel and cement plants as well. There's obviously also um, opportunity for hydrogen to be used in transportation as well. Um, and Brian spoke you know, extensively about that. Shelley spoke about hydrogen being able to be used in power generation and power storage as well. Um, but there's also building in heat as well. And, and there are trials, for instance, in the UK that are underway to be able to um, use hydrogen in, even in residential heating. As you can see here, um, we don't think you need to be overly purist about the hydrogen opportunity. So obviously we wanna see the, de you know, the transition um, to, to zero carbon hydrogen. Um, but we think there are um, interesting opportunities and investor, as, as investors, um, we believe that there are interesting investment opportunities in both blue and green. Um, and so as a fund, for instance, we've made investments into methane pyrolysis, which is where the carbon is captured in a solid form and can be then sold and used in other applications. So you can monetize that carbon. Obviously, we're huge believers in green hydrogen as well. Um, and we think that over time, we're really going to see that, that market take off. But that's, um, you know, I, I believe, you know, this is, this is a very, very exciting market for investors of all kinds. So two, two um, theorems underpin all of our investing, and that is the value chain and collaboration. So if I speak to that, to, to those two. So firstly, um, the way that we approach investing is to look, take a value chain approach and we look across the whole of the hydrogen value chain, all the way from production to use. And we try to identify the pain points and the constraints where our investment should unlock um, the, the opportunity uh, and allow a lot more value to be created. And so we try to, to build a really um, broad, but also very deep picture of the value chain to identify where those constraints are. And so our investments are very much targeted towards those constraints. And when I talk about deep, I mean, because you may also wanna look at the subcomponents as well. So we'll have heard in the media, lots of talk about um, you know, green hydrogen production, but what about the components that make those up, such as the membranes, the bipolar plates? All of those things are going to need quite a lot of innovation as well, and quite a lot of support from, from early stage investors. The other theory that we have is around collaboration, and we truly believe that a supportive ecosystem is needed to be able to um, ensure that these companies um, grow uh, to, to their full potential. And so we always like to invest within a supportive ecosystem. It's not just essential for the money that's provided, the fund, the capital that's provided, but as I said before, it's absolutely essential so that these companies are able to have access to projects, to offtake, to collaboration efforts. Um, and, and so that we, we think of our ecosystem, obviously there's our investors, there's our co-investors, but we also think about um, uh, entities such as the RVC or potentially research institutes like the NREL that's also in Colorado or other industrial groups. Um, and we look to build really strong ecosystems that can benefit our portfolio companies. Finally, I just wanted to, to leave you with a little bit of a takeaway about how we think about um, value creation and, and also as investors, when you may be able to see some kind of value inflection point um, on the investment that you make. And Mike alluded to this earlier um, in, at the start of this, um, this session, that the timelines are a little bit longer in, in deep tech. 
Um, and But we, we tend to think that there are multiple value inflection points, and I've tried to outline these on the slide here. So we obviously have some, you know, companies, they, they start off um, with their Series A and their, you know, their earlier stage, and there's a certain amount of support that they're going to need. But as we go over time, that's when we need to, um, you know, see uh, other sources of capital coming in, such as growth capital, and eventually get to the point where you see with Plug Power, where you, you know, they're able to be supported just through um, listings and debt finance as well. But it's this early stage that's absolutely critical, and the angel and um, early stage investor network is absolutely critical to get these companies off the ground. Um, and we're seeing more and more ways of being able to um, realize value for investors at points along the way as it makes sense to hand over to new investors that come in and can support the company through the next stage of their growth. Um, I'll pause there. Um, so thank you very much again for having me and I look forward to the discussion. Uh, it was awesome, Michelle, thank you. Uh, I think that's, uh, you know, a, uh, what we were aiming for there is kind of a, you know, uh, what's happening in Colorado, uh, looking internationally at what's happening with fuel cells. And then I think Michelle's given us a feel for uh, how a venture capital firm in the hydrogen space sees the market. So hopefully that's given uh, all of us a, uh, you know, nice perspective of the hydrogen energy um, market. And uh, now we'd like to move over into the, uh, discussion portion of the uh, event. And uh, we would also encourage any questions. If you could type those into the chat, we'll try to weave those in here and uh, go from there. So uh, to get things going, one of the things I, I thought I'd like to hear your perspectives on and, and interaction about is um, what are the geographic investment trends in hydrogen energy? I mean, we have two international uh, folks here, and uh, you know, we have a sort of a startup in the Colorado Hydrogen Network. Um, could could you guys comment on you know what where is the you know is there a hotter geographic uh, section of the world uh, for hydrogen energy, and what are the trends there? And uh, you know, Shelley or Michelle, maybe I'd start off with one of you. Sure. Um, I mean, really, hydrogen is important um, to, I, I mean, we can, I think you have to make, again, the distinction between, as, a, as Michelle mentioned, the difference between green, gray, and blue hydrogen, of course. You know, industrial hydrogen is produced today, and um, it's going to take a long time for the transition for the price of the green hydrogen to go down. So in the meantime, we, we really need to make use of what we have and uh, to get to the different, you know, to get where we want to go. But um, if you look at um, who are the around wherever you have um, available high renewables, that's where you want to be able to produce the hydrogen. So you can see hydrogen activity in um, in Australia, for example, where they're looking to export hydrogen to Japan and South Korea, where there's a huge need. Um, the huge interest in uh, in uh, North Europe, and uh, there's you can see huge, many projects already moving forward in Germany and the Netherlands and in the UK, and um, and certainly. You know, um, there's been a, a huge in, interest in uh, now expanding also in the Middle East, a big project called Neom that Siemens is doing in, uh, in Saudi Arabia and, in, and even Africa is trying to get into the picture. So I think it's going to be very much a, a, a something that's going to happen around the world. But the, the need is to get the hydrogen from the places where you can produce it more inexpensively from renewables where they're more available and then need to move them and transport them effectively to the industrial places where they need that hydrogen. Michelle, oh. what do you guys see on the at AP Ventures? Yeah, yeah, very, very much the same. I mean, um, I think uh, 
we've seen a bit of a hydrogen wave um, and we've seen uh, governments releasing their hydrogen strategies over the last 18 months and really you know that accelerated with the onset of COVID when there was being a lot of interest put into sort of the Green New Deal I suppose particularly in Europe but um, as Shelley mentioned you know the Asian uh, countries are also really leading the way um, and we can see that you know with the Japanese and particularly looking at um, net zero by 2050 um, as a commitment um, also a similar commitment here in the UK. Um, hydrogen is definitely going to be part of the solution. And so where I think it's really interesting as you're seeing, as Shelley also mentioned, those areas that have a lot of uh, renewable energy um, uh, are really racing to be able to build the infrastructure necessary to be able to become large scale exporters of hydrogen. So places like Australia and the Middle East, and mm. I believe also the US is a, a great candidate for that also. Interesting, interesting. So hydrogen kind of the, the places where you can make it become more like you know oil producing countries in the hydrogen space. But Brian, do you you know where do you see uh, you know in the US? I mean, you, we talked about California, Colorado. Do you, and you mentioned Michigan? Do you see uh, other uh, initiatives uh, coming in the US? Well, I don't I don't have a lot of experience with investors, and that's why I've got. Uh, Seth Terry and, and uh, Patty Kelly on board to help with that. And so I, I don't want to answer a question I don't know the answer to, but uh, I will say that we all have to be aware that there are local or I maybe I'll call it regional considerations for hydrogen that make it a little bit different in different places. In Colorado, we've got really low electricity rates, so we can make it on site with electrolyzers through electrolysis. Pacific Northwest has an abundance and overabundance of hydropower. So they're making hydrogen there with that. Um, in the Utah area, they've got these big salt domes that they're going to use to store energy. So um, I, I would say, I guess, investors be aware that regional differences can kind of change the complexion of how things are done. So I'll leave with that. Cool, cool. Well, uh, along those lines, in, in terms of where it's getting made, and then the transport issue, um, you know, it seems like uh, transportation is somewhat of a uh, constraint in terms of uh, you know developing the technology um, what are some you know what would you guys say are the constraints what are you know things that are slowing down the growth of hydrogen well, if, maybe if I could just quickly start with that um, really transporting hydrogen is I like to call it a fool's errand because it's so voluminous and, and it's really hard to move and so things like ammonia can really help that uh, there are some new uh, technologies out there for pipelines, believe it or not, that can make that a very practical solution. You know, you think about the interstate highway system that provides a pretty good uh, right of way, if you want, for for pipelines. Um, there's a company called Smart Pipe that can, uh, and not to give them a free plug, but th uh, they have a technique of actually making pipe on site, kind of like they do with gutters, where you just have a machine that cranks this out continuously without seams. So we'll probably start to see some of those. You know, the, this need to go away from uh, uh, fossil fuels is driving just so much innovation that's not necessarily brand new technology. It's taking things, you know, as, as Shelley pointed out, electrolyzers come from the 1800s, but it's driving us to put those together in, in new and unique ways. And my, the best example I, I like is um, wheels on suitcases. We had wheels for millennia. We had suitcases for a long time. It took somebody an awful long time to figure out where you put those two together. And similar things are happening with hydrogen. Michelle, Shelley, you guys? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that's a question we ask ourselves every day, Mike, is, you know, where are those constraints that we should be chasing? I mean, um, one of the biggest constraints is obviously in the production of, of hydrogen, you know, being able to get enough, you know, hydrogen um, at the scale that's required. Um, and that helps because it brings down the cost as well. So obviously you need scale to get the cost down. Um, we also see this technological constraints as well, you know, and the companies that we invest in are, are where we think there is opportunity to address those constraints. So you know, I, I agree ammonia is a really, um, a really great alternative in terms of a liquid method of transporting hydrogen, but you need to be able to crack it back into hydrogen. So, you know, there's, there's, there's very little um, technologies that can do that cost effectively. Um, so obviously, you know, we believe Starfire offers an exciting um, option there. 
So, so all along, I think there's this opportunity, um, but it's at a both of a, a scale problem, and then there's a sort of a technology refinement problem. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, and just to chime in on that, just a second. Um, so Brian brought up the wheels on the, uh, the suitcases, which you know they have more and more wheels. It seems like um, I don't know any of the wheel manufacturers, but you know you can imagine there's a number of them. So. You know, Shelly mentioned that um, Gensel's uh, making an ammonia cracker, and then of course Starfire is making an ammonia cracker. For the investors, should they? Uh, is there a worry that you pick the wrong horse, or is that that you know there's there's so much uh, space that you know all the horses are going to end up doing okay? Yeah, I mean, as an investor, you want to make sure that um, you know. You don't put all your eggs in one basket, I suppose, to put it that way. We also think there's going to be lots of different solutions for lots of different things. So ammonia is a really exciting alternative for some solutions. It may not necessarily be the answer for everything. Um, and so obviously, you know, we've got investment also in um, liquid organic hydrogen carriers as well. When it comes to specifically when we're talking about cracking, that's a really interesting example because, again, it's, you know, what kind of application are you talking about? Is this a, a stationary app? You know, are you doing this for bulk industrial um, cracking of ammonia to hydrogen that you're talking about for specific, um, maybe on forecourts for refueling, or are we talking actually about putting it on board a vehicle and you may actually have, you know, ammonia to, to propel, a, to, to crack to a hydrogen to propel a vehicle. So lots of different um, applications means you need lots of different solutions, which gives space for lots of different technologies. Show me what's your take on that? I mean, you know, since you guys are in the getting into the cracker space as well. Well, no, I, I mean, I agree with what Michelle said very much. There's, you know, it's the, if you look at the amount of renewable energy that's um, really on the market today, it's still a very small percentage. We need every possible renewable energy um, uh, solution that we that we can use. And I, I think that we're not in, in competition one with another, but um, really we're looking to replace fossil fuels. So every application has a different requirement, you know, and it, it, the price um, for the different needs is going to vary. And, the, you know, it's very, very complex and, and very technical, but I think that there's definitely space for, for everything. It's a matter of understanding the use case and being able to support it. So um, I, I, that's, um, you know, the hydrogen is what I read a, a lot about it all the time. And clearly, you know, the issue for hydrogen is that it can go the longest mile to decarbonize those areas that have the, the biggest difficulties. So if we're talking about steel production or we're talking about, um, you know, um, CHP in, the, in certainly, it's not always going to be the cheapest solution, but it's going to be the the way that will um, successfully enable us to move away from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, uh, it's going to move on then. Um, what are some of the barriers that uh, are uh, the early adopters of hydrogen are facing? And we, you know, we've talked about the uh, uh, transporting it as being a barrier. Um, do you do you see the the cost of hydrogen right now coming down so that it becomes more attractive as compared to, you know, li literally gallon per gallon or uh, ga you know, kind of gallon per kilogram like Prime was talking about. But do you see those prices coming down and, and you know that re removing price as a barrier? I can speak. Oh, go ahead, Michelle. Okay. Um. Yeah. Absolutely. We absolutely see price coming down. Um. It is. It is a key constraint at the moment. So. Um. Uh. You know. You're going currently a lot of the projects that are. Um. You know. Are being supported either through. Um. You know. Uh. Really far-sighted. Um. And thoughtful government government schemes. Um. Uh, but absolutely, we see scale being able to deliver really significant um, price reductions. And so um, for us, you know, it's all about seeing um, investment into manufacturing of 
uh, large scale electrolysis to be able to get the cost of, um, of green hydrogen down. Um, and the same goes also for, you know, for, for blue hydrogen as well. Um, and technology uh, advantages will also help. Um, so as we, you know, improve our technologies, we'll also see the cost coming down. But a lot of this is just going to come from getting this, the manufacturing scale up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is that in the growth phase? I mean, you see that more in the growth phase, you know, you had that chart there uh, versus right now or in the uh, startup phase? Yeah, absolutely. So when you start to get solutions being designed in, that's when it gets really, really interesting. So for instance, if a large um, internet retailer makes an investment into a, um, into a fuel cell um, uh, or, or places a large purchase order, for instance, with a large fuel cell manufacturer, that enables that fuel cell manufacturer to be able to have the confidence to invest in huge scale up. And therefore, you know, all of the, the, the cost comes down just as a, a unit, um, a cost per unit comes down. So, so really we see, um, you know, in, in that growth phase, that's really where you see those costs beginning to come down. Because to Shelley's point, for, for a lot of these things, or I think Brian, you know, the wheels in the suitcase, for a lot of these things, the tech is there. It's now just about getting the volumes. Mm -hmm. so, so market acceptance, somewhat a barrier there in terms of, if you made more, you wouldn't necessarily be able to sell it right now. Yeah, that you need to get the offtake, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Brian, you were gonna comment? Yeah, except I was on mute, but thanks. Um, just to kind of take, take Michelle's point uh, that the scale of this and the developing the markets at the same time, you know, it does you no good to build a, a plant that produces hundred tons of hydrogen a day if you don't have a hundred tons of hydrogen business out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of businesses like a restaurant, you build a restaurant, people will come, they'll eat. But with the hydrogen industry, because this is kind of new and the, both the supply and the demand are kind of developing together, that's the really tricky part. And that's what we're trying to address with the Colorado Hydrogen Network and New Day Hydrogen is going out there and being the person that actually develops the market and the supply at the same time so that those two aren't out of whack and we don't build a fuel station and just let it collect cobwebs till we get customers. So I, I think we all need to keep in mind, trying to do the scale and, and develop it um, together is important. Oh, right on, right on. Shelly, uh, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with Brian very much. You know, there are a lot of in interlocking parts that have to go together, but you know, the, the we see the change is really happening so quickly. And now obviously with the incoming, um, you know, administration in the US and their strong commitment to, it looks like they're gonna be investing very significantly in hydrogen. I think that things are gonna change much more quickly than before. So it's hard to, you know, I, I don't think we can necessarily look at the same barriers that we had before, you know, fuel cells have been uh, available for a long time. And the, that is a big advantage that enables us to understand and get over some of the technological constraints. And in the recent years with so much investment in research and development, you see that overcoming all kinds of technical issues and problems that they had. You know, um, you talk about infrastructure, for example, obviously there was a lot of talk about power to X, power to gas, you know, the, the US and other countries all have huge investments in infrastructure for natural gas piping. And there's been a lot of interest to, um, to reuse as much of that for hydrogen as possible, and certainly there are issues there in terms of you know um, the the piping can be bit, very brittle and and there can be leaks due to the hydrogen. But you know the, with the amount of interest and money and and research going all at the same time around the world at once, and the fact that there's so much ability for collaboration between the different uh, parties and so much support on an international and on national levels, you know, between uh, the DOE and the US supporting fuel cells and hydrogen and the Hydrogen Council and the IEA, you know, there's information is being shared between different organizations and these issues are being, um, are being um, um, 
resolved much quicker than in the past. And if you tried to follow the news on hydrogen, you know, you could spend your entire day reading news and you'll never be finished. Every day there's something else. And that's really encouraging because it is so important for us to achieve our climate objectives. Right on, right on. Thanks for sharing there. Um, how much do you guys think, uh, you know, where, where's it at with regards to like, you know, Brian's with a, a, a nonprofit, you know, government NGO, uh, right, NGO sort of thing to uh, promote the use of, of hydrogen. How much is government programs around the world, uh, you know, impact, you know, driving uh, demand for technology versus in the market calling for it? I mean, are we in a, you know, are we mostly in government motivated uh, growth right now, or, you know, we start to see some shift to the private sector? Um, can you guys comment on that? Um, I, I can, I, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, that's okay, Brian. I, I was just going to say that certainly you see the, the uptake from both sides. I mean, you know, pr uh, private, public um, are working together and the number of organization, the number of, you know, ESG objectives from private corporations that are pushing for um, sustainability targets are pushing very hard carbon tracking, uh, life cycle tracking for in any in any industry, you know, almost any company today can't get away with uh, not coming forward and disclosing information about the use of carbon throughout their activities and operations. So if you look at what, you know, the support now from, um, from um, Amazon, you look at companies like Google and Microsoft who are looking to use hydrogen to support their data centers. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not only public, it, it really is coming from every direction. Oh, that's, uh, that's good insight, good insight. Brian, you were gonna uh, give us something? Yeah, well, we see the business case for hydrogen, at least for transportation, for fueling here in Colorado. And so we're not gonna wait, we're gonna move ahead. Now, that being said, we're absolutely trying to get some help from the state of Colorado, financial help, or in the form of policy. Um, we're in the state of transition to go move from fossil fuels to other fuels, whether it's transportation or other things. And so we need some help to get that started. And so we also work with the state to try to get um, policies, you know, maybe um, fuel uh, credits or vehicle credits, uh, low carbon fuel standards, those kind of things. I think the government can really help. But you know, governments move slow. They tend to like to do a study first, and everybody can look at it and decide. You know, they don't want to they don't want to misstep, and and that's fine, and that's the way it is. But um, we're certainly not waiting for that because we see the business case. Okay. Um, with the Biden administration coming in, I mean, could this be an inflection point to drive uh, you know, the market faster as, a, as the government, the U.S. government, invests more in renewables? Um, do, you know, do, you, do you think that that infusion of cash in the next, you know, uh, whatever, you know, probably take them a year or two to get rolling, but then, you know, by the time, you know, by the end of the, their term, uh, you know, we, we see a significant, well, is this a good time? I mean, is that going to light the uh, market on, on fire, or, you know, promote faster growth? I can, I can, I don't want to do all the talking, but, you know, there's, um, there's a term in German called zeitgeist, I mean, the spirit of the times. And I think that one of the big things that when governments get behind this is it gets everybody's attention. You know, look at the effect that uh, Greta Thunberg's address had on uh, people being coming aware of climate change. You know, and so I think that besides the direct money that governments can throw at things, it, it just kind of organizes everybody and, and it gets them kind of galvanized and thinking in the same direction. So I, th I think there's several effects that you know, government influence can have. Shell, Shelley, comments on that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. One one has to look at um, you know the commitments that governments have made. Uh, you know, in the in, well, I suppose outside of the US, you know, I refer to Japan and 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 the UK just to see how organisations and corporates there have then responded to that. 
um, because they they see those government commitments and they they recognise that change is needed and they you know they actively move. Um, we've we've been seeing the hydrogen market pick up over the last twelve to eighteen months quite significantly, but we fully fully expect you know with the the transition um, to the new administration that change that pace of change to accelerate. And there's been a few drivers, but it will definitely be a, an additional driver to that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good, good. Um, Shelly, any, anything to add or move on to another topic? I think we should move on. I agree with what they said. Okay, so uh, along those lines, um, one of the things that uh, it seems like we have a lot of, a lot of uh, different technologies uh, right now that are uh, being developed uh, to address different parts of the energy uh, hydrogen uh, when I say ecosphere uh, value chain, um, how you know has has there been? I mean, is there stuff that angel investors could do at this stage to help these companies? Um, in a you know, uh, in a from more of a business standpoint. You know, I can I can give my perspective. We typically come in to a business where there has been an angel investor, you know, previously, um, or, or we come in alongside an angel investor. And I mean, they're, they're a super great help to these tech startups. I mean, um, for a lot of these businesses, um, they're run by a bunch of incredibly bright, motivated people um, that have, you know, spent a large part of their career focused on the technology. Um, and it may well be, they don't, necessarily haven't spent as much time on the commercial aspects of you know taking a product from from the, the, the technology space or the lab space to create something that you know is going to be broadly adapt, uh, adopted by a, a broad market um, you know some of the the founders that we work up work with are in their 20s you know and early 30s um, so so angel investors provide a really great um, source of mentorship and coaching as well, because they can bring those commercial skills, those life skills you know, to these tech startups and help them think about things like, is, how are they gonna design a product so a customer is gonna buy it? Um, how are they gonna go to market? Um, all of what's their business plan gonna look like? What's the most important you know, segment to go after first? All of these kinds of stuff can be incredibly helpful in the difference between success and failure for a young startup. Shelly? Yeah, I, I'm not an expert on angel investors, but um, I kind of agree with what Michelle showed on her slide about the ecosystem. I think that, you know, it, it's a fairly complex issue. And um, honestly, you know, I think that um, it's wonderful to see that the, um, you know, the market is, is causing the oil and gas companies to get increasingly involved. They recognize that they can't move on uh, anymore with, the, with their traditional approach and getting involved. There are, there are a huge number of, um, you know, all of the, the big energy companies are looking to invest in, uh, in, in hydrogen and, um, and in all the technologies around it. There's a great deal of, um, activity, all kinds of, um, you know, um, competitions for, for startups and, and uh, accelerators um, and incubators for these companies to, they get a lot of support. So I, I can't really speak about the angel investors. It's not really my area of expertise, but I do think that bringing together these uh, these smaller companies and the larger companies and strategic support from partnerships will is what's going to push the needle. And it's really important because we only have nine more years, you know, until the global warming is going to reach a, a what, you know a catastrophic situation. I can tell you from our perspective, dealing with backup, I look all the time at you know the severe weather events that are happening, and it's so tragic. The issues with the bushfires in Australia. And the horrible situation with the hurricanes and the typhoons, you know, if we don't do something uh, and already it's too late, but, you know, whatever we can do to uh, mitigate the, the situation we have to do. Oh, I don't know. Thanks. Um, okay. 
Brian, you gonna say something? Oh yeah, I'd like to just add one thing and maybe I'll kind of turn the question around a little bit. You, you were asking what how angel investors can help the companies. I think there's a big upside for the angel investors as well because um, I see that things are only gonna get better with any uh, legislation or things that are put in place to make renewable energy more profitable. I think those are gonna help the investment that's coming in. I'll throw out another tidbit. There is a company up in um, Calgary that's discovered a way to pull zero carbon hydrogen out of old oil wells. Colorado has 16,000 abandoned oil wells, each of which could produce hundreds of tons a day of hydrogen for 20, 30 years at like 10 to 50 cents a kilogram. So, I mean, there's a lot of upside there and I, I, it really excites me and I'm, I'm hoping a lot of it comes to pass, we'll see. A little bit of a technical question. How much does the uh, qual is there a are there quality issues with hydrogen? Is all hydrogen the same? Yeah, I'll, I'm going to let Shelly comment to this too. But uh, uh, fuel cells used in vehicles, at least, uh, and, and most of the PEM, the proton exchange membrane fuel cells, need a very very pure hydrogen. But there are techniques. I know uh, Michelle showed one of uh, the people that they've invested in is Hyatt. Uh, Hyatt Hydrogen. Um, we actually are represented by them here in Colorado on our um, Colorado Hydrogen Network. And I did a podcast with, with one of the guys from Hyatt Hydrogen. They've got a compressor that is also a purifier. So yeah, you have to be careful and, and so forth, but it's definitely not an insurmountable problem and there's existing technologies to take care of it. Um. I don't know. Um, it's an, it, for, in our case, as I said, we're talking about alkaline fuel cells. So they're different than the PEM fuel cells that require the high purification and filtration. You know, every different process is going to add to cost. So everything we do is looking at uh, trying to reduce the cost, you know, every single step, uh, especially for our systems where we're looking at the parts of the world that are, are uh, trying to get out from under the, uh, the issue of being dependent on diesel generators that are causing you know, all kinds of health issues, air pollution and, and, and more. So, um, and in those places, you know, um, every, every cent makes a difference. So um, in the transport issue, or I, what I would try to, to respond to Brian about transport, um, you know, EVs, Really, the fuel cell makes sense in the large vehicles. If we're talking about light trucks, buses, and you know, and 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 the higher and heavier, because the heavier the battery is, the more space it's going to take up. That becomes more problematic. So, really, the sweet spot for for fuel for uh, fuel cells is going to be on the larger end of the scale, and the smaller uh, vehicles are going to stay with batteries. And hopefully we'll see more public transport and transport as a service, energy as a service, all kind of new solutions that will help us get out from under the issue of, uh, you know, of, of the, you know, the, the ridiculous amount of uh, energy that we put out in, <laughs> in transportation. But um, I'm, I'm, that's a getting off, sub, off topic. Um, but certainly... Um, I think that uh, issues of, I, I, I think I got off track. Why don't, Mike, you want to get me yeah. back on track? Sorry. Well, no, no, I was asking about the uh, quality. It's, it's hydrogen you know, that's made in a, from, a, uh, from ammonia, the same as hydrogen that comes out of the, uh, the old uh, gas and oil wells. And do you guys have to have a certain level of hydrogen to put in your fuel cells? Yeah, of course, um, hydrogen, well, hydrogen is a very clean molecule, but you need to, it depends on what your needs are. So for the example, for an alkaline fuel cell, we can tolerate uh, hydrogen, uh, we can hide, tolerate even 75% hydrogen, which is industrial grade. The PEM fuel cells are requiring medical grade, medical grade, which can be 99.9995. So um, it depends on what the requirement is and which electrolyzers you're using to produce the hydrogen that will determine the, pure, the purity of the hydrogen that you're producing and what you need it for. So in our case, our ammonia, we, we use the solution together. The ammonia cracker that we have 
it extracts hydrogen that's set it's a uh, 75% nitrogen wait i'm not going to make a mistake here 75% hydrogen and 25% nitrogen because and uh I'm not the chemist, so I hope I'm not making a mistake here, but um, so not close to the 99%, but th because the alkaline fuel cell is far more robust, we don't have any issues and our fuel cell can easily tolerate the, you know, the nitrogen just um, forms nitrogen molecules and then is released into the air as N2. So we don't have any issues in terms of the purity of hydrogen for our fuel cells. But I do know that for the PEM membrane fuel cells, there is a great deal of uh, uh, concern and for the, different, um, for the different vehicles that they have different requirements for the level of purification of hydrogen that they require. Thanks, thanks. Maybe one thing also just might be interesting for the audience is, is hydrogen's also an input in some of these um, alternative fuels. So, you can, for instance, make, um, obviously you can make green ammonia from, from green hydrogen. You don't then need to turn the ammonia back into the hydrogen. You can use the ammonia as a fuel as well and part, partially crack it or, or use it just directly as a fuel. But you can also use hydrogen as an input into other fuels like synthetic fuels. So if you combine um, green hydrogen with captured um, CO2, then you can make a, a synthetic, um, a synthetic, um, uh, methane um, from that. So ideally that should be a, you know, a CO2 free methane if it's been from direct air capture CO2. So, so hydrogen is a conduit to lots and lots of different solutions. It doesn't just have to be pure hydrogen. It's right, right, right. So uh, this concept of like uh, source and then application, I mean, it, it, it's right now we plug into the grid and you get electricity out of it. It seems like in the future, what we may be going to is more specific uh, applications which require certain uh, purity of hydrogen or uh, uh, the timeliness of volume and, and that being tuned as opposed to just plugging into the infinite supply grid where you can just pull as much power out as, as you want. Yeah, I mean, wherever you can use renewable energy at straight as renewable energy you should. But the, the problem is that there's a lot of either geographies or applications where you can't just electrify them. And so that's where hydrogen comes into play because it's the carrier of that renewable, that, that electron. Um, but you don't necessarily need to use the hydrogen as hydrogen. Right. It just seems like it's an interesting paradigm shift from, you know, uh, electricity is the same 60 cycles and, you know, uh, 120 volts. Uh, now we're just starting to see, well, what do you need it for? What's, what are the, the needs that you have at that particular uh, point of use? And then there's these different technologies. So, I mean, it just seems to me that that, that makes it a little trickier for the investors because right now you just think about electricity as it comes out of the, of the plug in the wall, but in the, you know, a lot of these different technologies, uh, like I know Shelly and I were talking about uh, elevators, that fuel cells aren't going to run the elevator directly. It's going to be a battery because it's a, a high need and uh, seldom used. And so uh, how, how much, you know, so, so sort of the whole infrastructure, it, it's a shift in, in, in mentality there. So, you know, how does that affect the payoff of the investments in so much as you know, somebody says, well, I could just get that off the grid. Why would I possibly want to do that uh, right now? So, uh, you know, what, what's, I guess, just puts back the question, you know, how fast is the hydrogen uh, market going to mature? And uh, where people start demanding, you know, they want to buy five, you know, 500,000 of the fuel cells of GenCell uh, versus today where they're, you know, slowly starting to get into use. How should the investors look at something like that? I mean, what you guys take on that? I mean, when are we going to get to the hockey hockey stick uh, part of the curve with uh, adoption and and therefore, uh, you know, uh, sales, you know, driving up the sales to significant levels, or or so that the growth uh, capital sees it and says, well, now's the time to buy uh, Starfire because it's you know it's going to be there in a year or two. Um, if I could talk to that. So 
Mike, I think one way investors could really be helped is to just think about um, a couple of things. First is, all right, if we decide all transportation is going to transition from fossil fuels over to electricity and all, all of the industrial processes and all of the building heating, uh, if you stop and think about that for a minute, that means that we're going to probably have to triple the grid. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means that we're going to have triple the amount of wires running everywhere. And so far, at least in the United States, people have been almost completely unsuccessful trying to get new transmission lines. People don't want to see them and so forth. So a, a possible way to do it, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but you could change that electricity into hydrogen and put it on pipes and send it around. You probably aren't going to get resistance putting pipes in to the ground. They're probably, I don't know, maybe they're on the same order of magnitude of cost. So there's that, but then there's other applications where hydrogen might be a better form of that energy. And I, I would say for transportation, um, it's just much more dense, it's light, it's easily replenished. We will never solve the, the battery charging problem because charging vehicles is not a function of the battery. You could have a perfect battery. It's a question of how much energy can you jam into that vehicle realistically? You can't put 10,000 volts at you know 1,000 amps into the vehicle. It's just, it's not safe. You'd need wires as big as your leg, as I like to say. So I, I think as a guiding principle, what, what needs to transition to hydrogen because it's a better fuel for what you're trying to do? High temperature processes, probably transportation. And how can hydrogen help to move energy across oceans or across continents and so forth? So hopefully that helps everybody. Yeah, thanks. Well, I'm getting the uh... <laughs> sign. So uh, I think we've... Uh probably go here a while. I mean, I could go a lot longer. I've really enjoyed uh, chatting with you guys and I hope our audience has as well. Um, so I'd really like to thank the panelists, Shelly, Michelle, and Brian. Thank you so much for dedicating your time to us. Uh, I, I really feel like it's a nice educational uh, event for the, the Rockies uh, investors and uh, the rest of our audience. So uh, thank you all very much. And uh, Emily, is it do we need to do anything else more formally to uh, wrap up or? This was awesome. Um, thank you, Mike, for bringing this group of brilliant people together for leading us down this hydrogen rabbit hole. Um, I thought it was a fantastic discussion. Like you said, we could go for hours, but um, yeah, really special thanks to Mike for organizing this. Thank you three for joining us. Um, anyone in the audience, I'm sure you are, will be able to find these three via LinkedIn. Um, they want to share contact for anyone interested, uh, you can do so in the chat. But, you know, otherwise, uh, we really appreciate all of you for joining us. If you have any questions about RVC more generally, always feel free to reach out to me or my team. Um, but with that, happy Thursday, and we'll see you all for another webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.